Hi everyone and welcome back to another video. Today I thought I'd make something that I haven't done for a while on the channel and that is a more of a personal video that's unscripted and sharing a bit more of my thoughts. So I'm going to do a bit of a Q&A answering some of the common questions that I've seen popping up in the comments um, but I also asked my Patreon supporters for some questions and I've written a few of those down in my notebook here so I'll work through those as well as generally sharing what I've been up to. I'm going to start with the question that I've used for the title of this video and it was a comment that I received that asked me if I had ever failed a test. I've looked through plenty of tests now on the channel so it's only a natural kind of question and apart from maybe my real analysis midterm I do have one interesting story about failing tests but it's not probably the kind of test that you would expect. So one test that made me cry as a teenager was the New Zealand full license driving test. I took this when I was 16 and a half and as the title says I failed it twice. On my third try though I did pass so I have my full license now but it wasn't without at least a little bit of misery along the way. In New Zealand you have three tests before you get your driver's license. One is a theory exam that I got 100% on. The second one is a one hour driving test where you do all sorts of things like three point turns and various maneuvers. That I also aced. I got 100% but the third test is the full license test where it's only a 20 minute drive and you go through a bunch of hazard detection things and general assessment of your driving. The first time taking the test I did really well for the whole time, hadn't done anything wrong and we were driving back to the testing facility to go over everything and just on the last little corner before getting to the destination I got done for going over the speed limit. I was going probably between 55 and 60 when the speed limit was 50 there and I just can't even explain that. It was so out of character for me because I'm actually a really slow driver and anyone that knows me would complain that I drive too slow so to have failed for going too fast is yeah kind of ironic but um I think that nervous energy of being in a testing situation just bubbled over right towards the end there and I wasn't really thinking straight. You think I might have learned my lesson though but the second time I took the test I did it in a different city. I did it in Christchurch um, whereas the first time I took it in a pretty small town that didn't even have traffic lights or multiple lanes or anything so it was a very different style of driving to taking it in a city. But the second time I took the test again did really well for most of the time. Didn't do anything wrong until the last intersection just pulling into the car park. Um, there was a stop sign and I didn't stop properly at the stop stop sign something that of course you have to do. Again I think I just didn't deal well with the stress of being tested and watched while I'm driving so that was that. Got to be like Spongebob at boating school for a while but eventually got it on my third try. A little taste of failure for me. This next question I must have had over a hundred times now. I get it all the time. Someone asking me where do you get all those exam papers from? How did you get special access? And sometimes people even shout at me in all caps with these really abusive comments saying why aren't you using gloves to handle these precious documents? Something along those lines. So I just wanted to quickly say in the descriptions of all those videos where I use original documents, exams, things like that, I do always link to the sites where I get them from and I don't have any special access. I don't have the original copy of Einstein's grades, rather I did enough research to find them on the ETH library website. That's the university that Einstein had gone to. Doing research to find all those original documents is probably the most time consuming part of some of my videos. There are documents that I would love to cover but they just aren't available online and not being able to travel to the libraries in Europe and look through the archives, um, I've never been able to cover those things so I do really appreciate when the universities put them on digitized versions of the archives and everything that I cover whether it's the exams, the grades or anything else they're always publicly available when I access them. I just print them out the best I can on my little home printer and then show them under the camera. One question I should address is the common one asking if I have an Instagram account. The answer is no. I disabled my account quite a while ago now and haven't really been on Instagram since. For me Instagram didn't feel like a positive place or a way to spend my time. I would get caught mindlessly scrolling through things and I would often wish that I had enough willpower to get off and go read a book or do something else. 
It's a platform that kind of made me feel bad about myself. Um, so it felt hypocritical for me to be posting photos and trying to grab your attention and try to make you stay on the app when I myself wish that I was spending less time there. There's also the general question of what I've been up to, how I've been doing. Um, I guess for the last two years or so I've lived a pretty reclusive life but to be honest that has very little to do with COVID and lockdowns. That's just the way that I live my life anyway and, and how I like to be. So without having to travel or any need to remove myself from this comfort zone I've just been enjoying living a very quiet existence. A huge amount of my time though has been spent on my special project called Finding X which is this animated short film that I've been working on for probably over a year and a half now. It's been really a massive undertaking. It all started when I applied for a grant from YouTube and Screen Australia and you know I pitched something fairly ambitious. This 10 minute stop motion animation all about mathematics. At the time I had never even done any stop motion animation but I thought yeah, I could learn that. But pretty quickly I realized I'm going to need some people who know a lot more about this than I do. And so I found some amazing people to help me with the animation, with the production, the music, the sound, the story. Um, and I'm really excited that this project is nearly finished and I'm hoping to release it by the end of January, looking at the 25th of January to put it up on my channel. Um, and it will represent really, you know, over a year of my life that I've poured into this. Pretty much everything that you'll see in the film is handmade from felt, so here's what some of that looks like. There are little houses that our characters live in, including our main character X who lives in this house here. X themselves came from this bit of felt here which I've painted with watercolours to give it that colouring. Our other characters include numbers, symbols and Roman numerals. All complete with their own unique accessories, hats, glasses, hair pieces. A small piece like this scarf might only get seen for a split second in the final video, but it still took a lot of work to make. This here is a little chalkboard that I made for a fairground scene. And these two windows are some of my favourite assets. I modelled them off the four colour theorem, especially the example given on the Wikipedia page. The four colour theorem states that you'll never need any more than four colours to colour in the regions of any map like this, such that no two adjacent regions have the same colour. So I had to make sure when I was cutting out all of these pieces that no two regions of the same colour were touching, and it was a little tricky but I think I managed to do it right in the end. So whenever I had any spare time I would be sitting on the floor cutting things out and gluing them together. The felt was then photographed and some scenes have elements of real stop motion but for everything else the images got sent off to Ben who brought them to life on the computer. I've made a website for Finding X to share things like the trailer and behind the scenes and I made it using Zyro who have kindly sponsored this video. Zyro is a powerful and super affordable web builder which is incredibly easy to use. You can create a website in a matter of minutes and their pricing starts from less than $2 a month with a 30 day money back guarantee and 24 7 support. This website I was able to set up really quickly. I started by picking one of their hundreds of templates and added the images, videos and text that I wanted. The grid editor makes it easy to line things up and Zyro automatically adapts the website for mobile view. There's a promotion on at the moment to celebrate the new year and new projects, so to get an exclusive discount plus a custom domain and 4 months free with any yearly plan, use my code TIBBIES or click on the link down in the description. They're really worth considering if you also have a project that you want to easily share with people. The next question I wanted to answer is one that asked me to share a bit about my creative process making videos. And I think this makes sense to talk about after having shared the progress of Finding X with you, um, because I have a lot of thoughts about maybe my philosophy when it comes to content creation and you know even a bit of confusion there on what really is the best approach. Always a motto that I really liked is one that my mum says which is minimum effort maximum gain and it kind of sounds a little bit rude almost but I think it's kind of true um, especially with YouTube 
um, social media and growth on these sorts of platforms, it seems more important to be putting out a lot of content that isn't quite perfect rather than taking ages to upload real masterpieces. Um, and this is what you see with my regular content. With my normal videos, they're far from perfect. They're often just made entirely by myself and there are so many aspects that in hindsight could be a little better, but Really, if I think about it, what would the payoff be in terms of getting any extra views if I spent, you know, many extra hours on transitions or fancy sound and things like that? I kind of, for the most part, think, nah, don't go too fancy, just put it up and people are there for the core message anyway, and me investing all that extra time probably won't result in many more views or, or that much more enjoyment. So then why have I spent a year and a half painstakingly slow? slaving over this Finding X project. It is perfectionism to the level that every single thing that you see in it has been through multiple sets of edits, has passed through multiple eyes and had multiple opinions on if it's the very best thing for that particular spot. And I really lived and breathed every aspect of this project for so long now. Given that there are multiple people involved in it as well, I feel like I can't release any version of it that is less than perfect. It's been a lot of stress to do, and I'm not convinced that after all of that, that it would perform any better than any other regular video on my channel. For most videos on YouTube, I don't believe that there is any correlation between effort and success as measured in views. I know that my my most viewed video is definitely the one that had the least effort put into it and even some of my ones in the top 10 most viewed you know they're kind of ones that I didn't expect to do well but just took off maybe thanks to the statistics of if you put out a lot of stuff at least maybe something is bound to be good I won't be upset if Finding X gets less views than say this Q&A it's possible um, but that's not really what Finding X is about it's not a project that I understand took to get max views. I think there are many different roads I could have taken if that was the goal. I think Finding X is something that I'm always going to be proud of. I think it looks really beautiful. I think it's an approach to sharing math to people in a way that I haven't really seen before and I really hope that you enjoy it too. In terms of my creative process for the rest of my videos, it starts off with quite a time-consuming phase of research where I really like to live in the topic for at least a few days. I read everything about it that I can, maybe go off on a tangent watching documentaries about the topic on YouTube, um, really soak up all the knowledge about whether it's a certain country, their exams, or a certain character from history, um, and then I try to condense that into a script. I only ever really script the face cam sections of those videos, usually that's the intro. For anything that's overhead I feel like I can breathe a sigh of relief and just talk off the top of my head in those sections because I know I don't have to worry about looking at the camera, looking good, or saying sentences without too many cuts and things like that. I can really just drop all of the knowledge I know and it doesn't matter if it comes out in a scrambled way, I can deal with editing it together to be a succinct story later. To do that editing probably takes me about a day to a day and a half depending on how intensely I'm working on it. I do the editing myself on my laptop using Final Cut Pro and I still use my Canon G7X as my main camera. Um, it's probably one of the least professional cameras to use for something like this, especially as my channel grows. But sometimes I joke that I don't want people to see me in 4K, especially if I have, you know, a pimple or a bad hair day or something. I don't want people to be able to zoom too close into that. I'm still trying to keep to that motto of keeping things as simple as possible and my fairly minimal setup for these videos seem to have worked alright so far with only a few complaints here or there. One of the questions I got was, three years later, are you still at peace with your decision to quit the PhD? And the answer to that is yes. I'm still pretty happy that I left my PhD and I don't regret it yet. Having been three years now, a lot of my friends that I was doing PhDs with at the time have now graduated or are graduating right now and are looking for maybe postdocs or other jobs. So I do feel that feeling of, oh, if I had have stayed, I would have been graduating now and I'd be a doctor now and I could be going out and, and doing those things too. But especially with it having just been New Year's, I always write out my goals around that time, my goals for the year and things like that. 
And, you know, I've noticed none of them actually include anything that has a requirement for a PhD. So yeah, I still don't feel like it's something that I needed for the things I want to do. And I feel endlessly lucky and grateful to have my audience on YouTube, which I often think is a little bit more powerful anyway. And I still get really cool opportunities coming my way. Next week, I've got a video coming out, which is a collaboration that I did with IBM about quantum computing. And I love doing that. That was like a dream thing to be able to work on. Having said that, I'm still so fascinated with many questions in science and I don't think I can ever leave that curiosity behind and that's what attracted me to the PhD in the first place. It was never about the credential, it was about the experience and who you become getting that opportunity to do research. If anything, I don't have plans to return to a PhD program anytime soon, but I have this pipe dream of maybe approaching a local uni and asking if I can work with them as sort of, you know, a research assistant for a few months or something. And just being able to have a taste of that research environment again and maybe pick and choose a few different topics I'm interested in. I still don't think I'd be able to stick to one niche topic for the three or four years that it takes of a PhD. Up next we have the mildly requested bookshelf tour. This is just what I've got on here at the moment. Here I've got my Newton's Principia copy that I have used in a few videos. Fun fact, I bought this online and I didn't like the cover that it originally came with, so I printed off this original cover and then stuck it on with like transparent book tape. This one looks like a stolen math book from school, but it's actually not, at least I didn't steal it. My mum loves going to op shops and she sometimes gets me books as like a present, which is really nice of her. Um, but she knows I'm interested in something to do with maths and physics, so if there's ever a book that has maths in the title, she'll probably bring it home for me. This one she got me from the op shop recently, it is the Journal of the Korean Mathematical Society. It's literally a bunch of printed out, really abstract math papers from some July 2017 conference. These are some more secondhand books. This one I got, it's from, oops, upside down. The Ambidextrous Universe by Martin Gardner. A story about Galileo's daughter that would probably make for a good video one day. These Marcus Chown books are pretty important to me because I bought these when I was in high school with some book vouchers that I won at school. They're probably some of the first physics-y books that I ever really read. This one here, Fred Watson's Star Craving Mad. Fred is an Australian astronomer and science communicator and he was working at the Australian Astronomical Observatory in Sydney when I was an intern there. So I got to meet him and spend some time with him and so this book is actually signed. Dear Toby, from one astronomy communicator to another, with very best wishes for a sensational astronomical career. All the best, Fred. It's funny to read this because at the time he wrote this, I wasn't even making videos on YouTube. This has got nothing to do with my YouTube channel. He just knew I was involved with some in-person science communication. I've got a mathematical nature walk, Contact by Carl Sagan, Alice in Wonderland, a little book of string theory of which I have some bookmarks in that show you I never made it all the way to the end. I've got this little book in here which I have a poem published in from school. I might as well show you these library books I've got out here now too. This is written by George Gamow, Mr. Tompkins in Wonderland, dedicated to Lewis Carroll and Niels Bohr. I haven't read it yet so I don't have too much to say. After making my recent video about Kepler's Somnium, or The Dream, I actually found a copy of it in the library, surprisingly enough. Kind of wish I'd found this earlier instead of having to just read everything off the computer. For the most part, when I look at my bookshelf, I think, oh, I wish I could read more. I'm such a slow reader. I don't know if it's good or bad. I try and say that's good because at least I stop to think about things, you know, between every few pages. But it also means I barely ever get anything finished. This here is a little lunchbox that I actually got from Educon um, when I went to America back in 2019. They um, got someone to spray paint all of our channel names onto these lunchboxes, which I think is so cute and so thoughtful. So it deserves a little spot on the shelf. Educon was probably the best event I've ever been to because I got to meet some of the creators who I've looked up to for so long who were nothing but kind and willing to help even the smallest creators. Sometimes I think the highlight of my YouTube career is having been able to mix with them on something like equal terms. 
Last point of business is a hair update because this never otherwise makes it into frame. In fact, it's pretty hard to get it in now. Um, but yes, I do have absurdly long hair. No, I haven't had a haircut for probably 10 years. And yeah, it's probably just down to my knees at the moment or just past. Um, but there you go, that's a hair update. Thanks for watching this video and thanks to my Patreon supporters. A special shout out to today's Patreon Dog of the Day, Yo-Yo.